My name is Nuan Daes. I work as a uh, Vice President and Deputy CTO for the API Management and Integration Space at WSO2. I'm also the co-author of uh, Microservices Security in Action, which was launched about uh, just over a year ago. So you can reach me out on Twitter or LinkedIn. My handle goes as Nuan Daes, N-U-W-A-N-D-A-S, as you can see on the screen. So I'd love to get in touch um, with you all so you can reach me out on LinkedIn or, or through Twitter um, if you have any questions and you know if you have to um, if you have uh, want to have a chat so we have a lot to cover up today uh, so I'll briefly introduce a plan for the next uh, 45 minutes or so so we are going to look at what it takes to build the enterprise APIs um, in today's world and I figured out that there's a lot um, while preparing for the session so we are going to look at what it takes to build the APIs um, in, in today's verse, we are going to look at some of the problems we face. We are going to look at some types of APIs that we have to deal with in enterprise architecture and their roles and responsibilities. Uh, and then we are going to dive in into the the way to address these problems and what 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 are the key characteristics to be looking out for and to be paying attention to when building um, when building APIs in a in a cloud native in a microservices architecture. Right, so we are going to go through a few items from marketplaces to, to the API lifecycle and so on, and we are going to wrap it up after that. So let's get started before, uh, without further ado. So, so in today's world, you know, I'd like to start off by defining very briefly what an API is. Right, so an API is a contract, it's a function that is usually exposed over the network. When we refer to an API today, we refer to it as a function that's exposed over the network. And the beauty of the world that we're living in today is that APIs are everywhere. And I kind of love it. It, it enables so much possibilities and make, it, it makes life so much easier for businesses to basically focus on innovating, right? It's, it's a wonderful thing because it helps businesses to focus on building what is core to their business and it allows them to reuse stuff from all over the place. So if you take a quick look at this picture, you'll see that there are so many APIs out there from different industries from communications to, to 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 retail to storage to payments banking basically anything so if you are basically building a business today you really can focus on what's core to you and focus on reusing uh, what's not really core to you for example if you want to build an api or, or some kind of a service that has to deal with some retail functionality Right, that's what's core to your business. And as part of that, if you if you want to send notifications, SMSs to customers, and so on, right, you don't really have to worry about that part. Now. You can reuse um, Twilio or some some other API in that space to get that done, and just forget about it and let them worry about all the problems of dealing with that and focus on building what's core to you. So that's that's the power of what APIs enable. It, 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 it helps us to get started very fast and you know get into business much much faster than than a decade before. So if you look at building APIs today, right? So these building APIs are done primarily by developers and, and architects, right? So there are a number of frameworks that help developers and architects to get started. So if you're from the Java world of things, you'll have heard about Spring Boot, Drop Wizard, and so on, Express for Node.js, right? And, and Flask for uh, Python developers and so on. Um, so there's also Ballerina, which we launched uh, Ballerina is actually a, a language which WSO2 introduced about five years ago into the market, which is specifically designed for API programming. So we thought it, it, it's, it's a good idea. It's time the world sees uh, a language that is focused on API building and integration, um, you know, uh, compared to having to deal with libraries and frameworks and so on. So that's why we introduced Ballerina some time back. Um, but at the end of the day, you can use any of these frameworks and build APIs. You can write the business logic. But the real set of problems comes when you talk about taking it out into the market, taking it into production, right? Taking it, making it production grade or enterprise grade, right? So let's let's dive in and see what it takes to build APIs, uh, enterprise APIs today. So we are going to pretend that we are um, a development team that's building. Uh, some APIs for a retail organization. This is a very common example on the internet where um, when you're talking about microservices, many people uh, use this example of the of building an order API for a retail store. 
right? So <clears throat> if you think about building this simple API that processes an order, uh, immediately you get into the um, nuances of building this now. Now, if you're processing an order, right, if you're a developer, given the responsibility of building this API, you will know that it has to do certain, certain things such as processing the payment, updating the inventory, making sure the shipping um, stuff is done and so on. And when you are in the mindset of, you know, de designing this or implementing this using a microservices architecture, it's quite natural that you separate these functions into, you know, their own respective microservices, right? So all of this becomes the odd API now. I have a very simplified version of it in this picture, right? Um, you all, I'm sure, understand the complexities of doing this, right? This is an extremely simplified version of this, right? So an API today is never a standalone program. It's almost always a distributed application, right? And there, there are, it gets more complicated because there are different styles of APIs that you have to deal with, right? Different types of APIs that you have to deal with. And most often than not, you'll have to deal with like cross team collaboration for building your APIs because you're highly likely to have um, APIs that are built by other teams who, which you want to reuse, right? Like for example, if, if another team has built a products API and you want to reuse some of that functionality, it makes no sense to build it yourself, right? It makes sense to reuse what they have. So you need to do cross team collaboration for building APIs today, right? So uh, similarly, there are a number of challenges that developers would have to face, and I see them as you know mainly as twofold. I've listed a few of the challenges here. I haven't gone into listing every single one of them because I want to focus on the solutions today more than the problems, right? So some development time challenges we face are on the lines of discovery, are on the lines of you know once you discover it, how you program against it, and so on, right? And when it comes to runtime challenges you have to deal with resiliency problems <clears throat> security scale and so on right so so one of the complications in distributed systems is that functions are now distributed across the network they are on several nodes they are not running in a single cpu as it used to right so so the rate of failure is high but you can't escalate or you know push back those failures to clients you have to try and resolve them then and there itself which involves resilient program Right, so these are some of the challenges that developers have to face uh, when they are doing this uh, thing for real, right? When they go beyond writing the code for their business logic and going, uh, taking this into production now, right? So we expand our use case a little bit and uh, try to make it a little bit more realistic. So I've tried to explain or, or visualize what a typical enterprise architecture of this API would be. Now, I'm sure you all are familiar with the concept of an API gateway. So in a typical enterprise architecture that is API driven, you'll have the API gateway as the entry point into your system. So that will be sitting at the edge, right? And we have our orders API, which is basically exposed uh, through the gateway to consumers. And the orders API now does its magic, right? By talking to the different kinds of uh, systems. So as you can, as you know, may notice in this, uh, it does several things like the orders API uh, com communicates with the payments API for processing the payments when the order is being made. It saves some order details in a database. Uh, it also talks to um, the Twilio API to send notifications to customers, right, to the customer who placed the order. The payments API talks to probably Stripe or something like that to get the payments and so on, right? The orders API also would need to uh, talk to the inventory API and the shipping API to do uh, their respective functionality. Now, if you observe this carefully, you will see that there are different types of APIs that we have to deal with and different styles of APIs as well, right? Let's take a look at what these are in detail. Right, so we had to deal with what we call edge APIs and domain APIs, right? So if you go back to the previous picture, edge APIs are the ones that are directly exposed to the consumers and the domain APIs are the internal ones that really don't have a need to be exposed to consumers. So you have these different types of APIs that you have to deal with. So when you're setting up your enterprise architecture, you need to make sure that only the edge APIs are exposed to your consumers and the internal ones are not. 
You also have to deal with third party APIs like Twilio and Stripe, for example, right? You have to deal with synchronous APIs. So synchronous APIs means the request response style APIs where you have to get things done then and there itself. You can't offload these things to a separate thread to process. So the payments is one such example. You need to process the payment at the time the order is being processed. You can't do it later. But comparatively, if you look at the shipping and the inventory updates, those are things that you don't really have to do real time. You can delay that a bit so you can do it asynchronously, which saves us, you know, response time to the customer who's making the order, right? We can respond to, it, uh, to the customer faster by making sure those happen offline and in a more reliable way as well, right? So we have to deal with synchronous and both asynchronous APIs. We also have to deal with uh, data sources and event streams. So if the developer of the order API needs to update a database, this developer needs to know how to find the connection URL, the connection um, credentials, and so on, right? And for asynchronous communication, this developer needs to find um, the, the event stream, the message broker or something like that, right? So, so in a typical enterprise architecture, we have to deal with all these different types uh, of APIs at the same time, right? When you are implementing something for at, a, at an enterprise level, right? So the first most important thing that I want to talk about to be today is the discovery of all these different types and styles of APIs that we have to deal with, right? So if you look at current frameworks that developers have to build APIs such as uh, Spring Boot, for example. Uh, the way you discover or the dynamic discovery is done in such frameworks is using libraries like Netflix, Eureka, for example, right? Now, these solve a very small portion of the problem where it helps you to find like the, the, the IP address of the payments API dynamically, maybe the IP address of the inventory API or the shipping API dynamically and so on. But it doesn't really solve the problems of you know, where, how do I find Stripe's URL, Stripe's credentials? How do I find, you know, how to connect to Twilio? How do I connect to the database, right? Because these things change based on environment as well, right? Uh, your, your, the, the, the Stripe, for example, if you're connecting to Stripe, you'll use it, their sandbox URL in, in lower environments because you really don't want to be doing payments for real in your developer and QA environments, right? So you'll have to do uh, only you'll want to do payments only in the production environment. So these kinds of systems such as Eureka and other similar frameworks, they solve a part of the problem, but there's a lot more to be resolved here, right? So what we really need, what developers really need is an overarching marketplace that captures everything, including internal APIs, third party APIs that you may be interested in using, data sources, event streams, the whole package. Right now, when talking about third-party APIs, there are public API marketplaces that help you to find these things. I've listed some here. There are a few more if you really search for it. Now, these give you a listing of third-party APIs that you can rely on to um, to build your APIs. But then again, this again solves another part of the puzzle, not the entire problem. So, what we really want is an overarching marketplace, uh, as I mentioned before. And here are some characteristics to look out for in such marketplaces, right? You need, first of all, visibility into all dependencies in your system, including endpoints and even libraries, right? So for example, if you have uh, like a product object, right? A product schema in your organization that you use across teams, you really don't want each team to come up with their own product schema, right? You'd want to uh, have one defined schema and make all teams reuse that schema. So again, what you need is an overarching marketplace which gives you visibility into all of these things. And then things like categorization, searching, and being able to filter by different dimensions becomes important. Governance also becomes critically important because you'll never have a situation where you allow everyone to see all the services in your organization. You'll definitely come across use cases where you want to restrict visibility um, of uh, of certain services to certain user groups, right? And now another important aspect is you may control visibility at a UI level, but how do you control um, access at a runtime level? So you really need a system where whatever rules you apply 
at a, at a UI level eventually get translated into the runtime level as well. What that basically means is you may prevent someone from seeing an API on the UI, but how do you prevent that someone from figuring out the URL of that service and accessing it anyway, right? Through by writing some code that needs to be prevented too, right? So what you need is uh, this kind of a marketplace that is not just cross-cutting and gives you full visibility, but also has a linkage uh, relationship to the runtime as well. And administration of credentials is also an important aspect, right? If you have like a Salesforce account that you are using in your organization and you want your developers to build some APIs that connect to Salesforce, um, you won't really want to share your Salesforce credentials with those developers. What you would want to share is a connection that can be reused by developers without sharing your keys and stuff that connect to Salesforce, right? So this is a kind of marketplace that is really needed for an enterprise to uh, to be productive in developing uh, good quality APIs, right? And the second important aspect I want to talk about is the aspect of programmability. So once you've discovered the APIs that you want to connect to, once developers have the visibility into the APIs that they want to connect with, the second important aspect is how good are those APIs in terms of programmability. So the programmability is basically the ability to, you know, interact with it, right? So discoverability, of course, becomes uh, uh, an important concern, but also then you need to figure out how do you connect to it. And this connectivity is not one time, as I mentioned previously as well. Connectivity has to be ensured across all your environments as you change the environments. How good is the documentation of the API, right? How is it readable? How good is it? How, like, is it of good quality and so on, right? What's the level of complexity in getting keys to access those APIs, right? What's the level of complexity required to program resiliency? All of these things becomes complications to the developer uh, at the end of the day to deal with, right? And what happens most often is that people tend to you know, not treat security as so, so so important because obtaining security stuff and treating them properly is extremely hard. So you need a system where these are taken care of gracefully um, and easily so that developers can be productive. So let's take a look, take a look at a quick example piece of code. Again, I copied this from uh, Twilio's developer portal. This is a piece of Python code which um, which is basically coming from in from their Python SDK and teaches us how to access their SMS API. So you see right about here we have initialized the Twilio client uh, by loading some uh, SID and OAuth token from the environment, right? And you initialize the client with that, and then you use that client to send a message um, by specifying the message and the phone number and so on. So this looks straightforward. But when you get into the details, you see some problems such as, right, so you did obtain some keys from somewhere through the developer portal, which is probably straightforward. And it was loaded into the environment, but how did that happen, right? Uh, where were the keys stored? Did the developer type it in in some kind of a configuration file um, and load it in, right? So the developers have to be aware of such actions and do them carefully so that they don't leak this information outside, right? How are these credentials propagated through their CI/CD pipelines? All of these are become things to consider when programming against such APIs. And also error handling. We did not see how, how uh, in that particular example, uh, there was no example of uh, how to deal with errors and so on, right? Net, both network errors and also uh, business logic errors, such as an invalid phone number, right? Uh, invalid expired credentials and so on. So you need to be able to, you know, you need to understand that these errors could happen and program accordingly, right? So you really need a much richer SDK than what is uh, provided in order to take care of all of these things when programming against these APIs, right? So that's about the programmability aspect of, of uh, APIs. Developers really need uh, richer SDKs that can take care of not just the business logic, but also the non-functional and security related concerns 
when programming against these APIs. Security obviously is a major, major area of concern for any API driven system, right? As you all know, the, the cost of a security breach comes in millions and millions of dollars, right? And APIs are highly, uh, are highly attractive to uh, hackers and, you know, people who are trying to get, gain invalid access into your system. And most people think of API security as authentication and authorization, but it goes a lot more deeper than that. Let's, let's take a look at what I'm uh, trying to explain. So first, in order to understand API security properly, you need to have a good understanding of the landscape you're dealing with, right? So again, I took the same example as before, simplified it a little bit by removing the unnecessary parts, right, uh, in the context of security. So the first area to understand is what we call as the North-South API security, where you have users coming in from outside, like outside your business domain from the internet into your system. So you need to be aware of how do you secure that channel, right? And beyond the API gateway, you now come into your system, which is what we call as East-West security. So beyond the point of the API gateway, you're talking about, you're talking between services basically, right? You're passing messages around. So you need to be aware of how to secure East-West communication channels uh, between APIs. Then you have some APIs talking to APIs that are outside your business domain, such as the Stripe and Twilio example. These could be completely third party APIs like Stripe and Twilio, or these could even be APIs that are owned by different teams in different business domain in the same organization. They both more or less fall, fall under the same category. So it's important to understand this landscape, the differences in each of these areas to secure our system or our APIs properly, right? So what does it really mean to secure an API at the edge, right? Beyond or like at the API gateway. So these are some aspects to be um, aware of to secure your API. So for, if you have some kind of a client coming into your system, you first need to make sure that it's a, an actual client, not a bot looking out for holes in the system then you need to do the authentication and authorization. You need to be aware of preventing DOS attacks and you need to be checking the payloads to see if there's any malicious content in there. And once all of that has gone through successfully, once the message is going out now with the data that it asked for, you again need to do uh, payload scanning to see if there's any malicious content going out. You need to see whether the request of this data is actually eligible to receive this data. For example, if someone is asking for a user profile information and you shouldn't really be sending the telephone number and address right to that particular client, you should be removing those parts from the messages and so on. And whatever systems you put in place, you have to accept the fact that someday something is going to go wrong. And on that day, you need to have all the data you can possibly have in order to identify the issue so you need proper surveillance in place possibly with some kind of artificial intelligence to do you know pattern analysis and so on to see if things are um, as they should be and then logs are obviously uh, one of the best practices that we are all aware of so these are basically what it takes to protect your apis at the edge right and when going beyond the edge now we get into the authentication space so your authentication is usually straightforward. Most of us dealing in the API space are familiar with it. So what you do is um, you come in into the system by getting a token from a trusted service, which is usually called an STS, a security token service. This is basically OAuth2 in most cases when you are dealing in the world of APIs, right? And you send the token into the gateway, the gateway trusts the issuer usually, and uh, based on that trust, it allows the request to pass through. And at this point, the gateway terminates the end user or client authentication. But we need a system where this client's details needs to be propagated to upstream services. And that is usually done by what we call as a JWT. So the security context is at this point transferred over into a JWT and passed upstream. This is like entering a building, right? If you're a visitor to a building, what you usually do is you come across the security personnel um, first, right? So then you show that security personnel your ID 
it can be your identity card or driving license or, or something and once the security uh, personnel has checked it they give you um, some kind of other id which you can hang around your neck or you know pin to your shirt or whatever right so it's like it's basically like entering a building so once you're in the building now although the people in the inside the building may not know you uh, they they now feel safe because the security personnel at the gate has verified you and given you an id that is uh, that, uh, that that allows you to walk inside the building right it gets more complicated when it comes to like when you're in a hotel for example right uh, you may be given an access card that can only access certain floors in the hotel right the floor in which your room is for example right so that's an example of a scope token where you are given a token with a, a limited set of permissions only you can't roam across uh, the entire building you can go into only certain designated areas so this is very similar to that and once you are inside the system you usually uh, are inside a trust boundary which is usually achieved through mutual TLS and so on. So this is a system where once you're inside now, if you have like 10 microservices in this trust boundary, um, these are this trust boundary is created by mutual TLS and each of these 10 services are allowed to talk to each other because of the uh, mutual trust between them. Now, there are also cases where you need to go beyond mutual trust, right? And you need to create a zero trust environment right such as for example when you're talking about the payments api you really don't need anyone else other than the orders api to talk to it uh, even though all the others may be in the same trust environment payments as we all know is a sensitive operation so you need as much security as you can on that so the way to achieve that is by using an internal sds uh, an internal security service where the orders API talks to the STS before it talks to the payments API and says, uh, Mr. or Mrs. STS, can you please give me a token that is valid to talk to the payments API and the STS will basically verify who you are and do the due diligence and give you a token. And at the payments API, it will check if the caller bears a token that is allowed to talk to, talk to it. And that's basically how you achieve uh, zero trust um, with this kind of a system plus mutual TLS as well, right? And and performance, there are of course performance concerns when you do that, but there are ways to uh, you know get around it, such as with caching and you know doing stuff on on startup and so on. So again, security is a, a broad space, uh, so we need to take all of these things into consideration when we go beyond the point of having implemented the logic and now going to deploy it in production. We get into the next uh, pillar of our, of our session today, which is monitoring. So I'd like to talk, uh, like talk about monitoring um, in the like as as in the why case. Like, why do you need monitoring? If if your system is, if you can guarantee that your system will never fail, can operate without any issues, you really don't need monitoring. So why do you need monitoring when you think of it in that way? You need monitoring. Uh, to fix things when when things break right when something breaks you need monitoring so that your developers can go in look at the data and Fix whatever the issue is as fast as possible So how this works in practice is when something goes wrong developers get called up uh, They look at the data that's available and they then build hypothesis saying okay This could be the reason right and then they come up with some kind of a patch and then they apply it and see if it really solves the issue and if it does great if it doesn't they look at the data again look at perhaps new data and they keep iterating until they get to the uh, root cause of it right now the issue with distributed systems is uh, monitoring distributed systems is exceptionally hard compared to monitoring a monolith and we all know why that is right if you look at a monolith you have everything in one box you have one set of logs one cpu report one memory dump and so on but if you look at a distributed architecture a single transaction spans across uh, uh, apis right so you have multiple sets of logs multiple sets of cpu reports and multiple sets of memory dumps to be looking at when troubleshooting an issue so this becomes increasingly hard but the good news is that we have tools today uh, that allow us to analyze this data. So if you look at, so observability, observability is defined as, you know, a collection of metrics, traces, and logs. 
So we have tools like Prometheus, which gives us metrics. We have tools like Jager, Zipkin, which gives us tracing information. We have tools like Fluent and so many other things for log aggregation and so on. But the issue is that all of these tools are focused on their particular vertical only, right? So if you look at Prometheus, it will give you uh, a view of all matrix in the system. If you look at Jig or Zipkin, they'll give you a look at all traces in the system. But what developers really need to, in order to build more accurate hypothesis and uh, arrive at a um, good quality hypothesis is a cross-cutting view of all of this data uh, on a timeline, right? So what you really need is like, like on a, or for a particular time, what were the logs, what was the CPU, what was the memory, and so on, right? And whatever else you can get, right? So that is really what we are, what we should be aiming for in observing distributed systems. That helps developers to build much more accurate hypotheses that can help them to arrive at resolutions faster and arrive at more quality resolutions as well. Uh, and then when we're talking about arriving at resolutions, we all know that distributed systems, the, the one of the main challenges is finding which node is causing the problem. So today we have systems which give you like a, like a dependency graph, which is like great for understanding the system's architecture, but we really need a live version of it to say, you know, something's red, right? Something's throwing errors. So you need this, uh, a kind of a service topology view, which uh, tells you that there's errors, there's errors being thrown by a particular service. So developers can focus on that particular service and it will give you like a dependency graph of, you know, what other services it depends on and where else are you seeing abnormalities or errors, right? So that, that will help developers to arrive on conclusions faster and in a more accurate fashion as well. Right, so, and the final uh, pillar that I'm interested in talking about today is on the uh, life cycle of the API. So the API life cycle is kind of like an overloaded, overloaded term. Um, uh, different people use it for, for talking about different things, but I see the, the, the life cycle of an API as uh, two main things. One is, you know, about getting your API from development to production right basically completing the development life cycle of your api and the second aspect of it being as so once you are in production how do you evolve this api now right how do you make sure it's going in the direction that you want it to go so so managing the life cycle is about both aspects of it right so we have to deal with typical devops processes ci cd pipelines you know, in order to get this up and running right and we'll talk get into the details of um, how business insights and uh, API versioning can help us to get get there, right? So when talking about uh, the implementation of the API, so your intention is basically getting from concept to implementation. And what you really need from a from a platform that helps you to build APIs is this ability of being able to iterate faster on your concept and design, right? So what that means is you go beyond the planning phase, you come up with a contract. As the developer of the API, you mock some data uh, that is corresponding to that contract, and then you bring in the consumers or the potential consumers of this API, and then you ask them to engage and get their feedback, right? And of course, at the same time, you have to implement your tests as well to make sure you're not breaking it as you make changes to the contract, right? So, uh, so this this is an iteration. So you do changes, you give it to the people who are going to consume it, you get their feedback, see if your API meets their needs and you iterate fast on this for, se for several times. And once both parties are satisfied, you now go into the implementation details of it, where you implement the actual business logic, right? So that's about getting into that stage. And once you're in that stage, once the development is now done, you have to now think about how do you get it into production? So this is where your CI CD pipelines, GitOps processes come into play, right? So this is now about getting an API from development to production. So the code of your API can be in some place, say GitHub, for example, right? So you need to deal with uh, GitOps processes, perhaps Git actions and things like that. 
to make sure you get the runtime of an API up and running in a development environment, right? Uh, now, one important aspect to remember here is that an API is not just about the code or the logic or the runtime. It also is about the contract and the configuration of the API. Right? For example, if your API is connecting to Stripe or Twilio right, or, or something else, the keys that are required to talk to those endpoints are part of the configuration of that API. Right? The, the, the URL, for example, again is part of the configuration because in the development environment, if you take Stripe, for example, as I was mentioning before, you may possibly need to connect to the sandbox endpoint instead of the production, likewise, right? So, uh, so when you're talking about moving an API from development to all the way to production, you're actually talking about not just the API, but also its configuration as well. So, so whatever platform you choose should enable this kind of ability, which takes your API from all the way from dev to production. And when you're talking about production, uh, the product deployment to production, so if, if this is the first time you are deploying the API, it becomes it's quite easy because you don't have it. But if it's not the if it's the second third time, you have to be aware of how do you do it without disruption as well. So this is where you need to be thinking about blue green deployments, canary deployments, right? Patterns where you can uh, deploy APIs without causing interruption to your clients, without making sure uh, like making sure that you are not breaking things as you go along right so these are important aspects to consider when considering the deployment of the api and then we get into the evolution of the api so this is where business insights come in handy so business insights are tremendously useful for figuring out what what to do next with your api what features should you introduce right and there are some important metrics that we can talk talk about one is obviously the usage metrics, like the number of transactions, number of errors, the latency reports, and so on. These can be used for coming up with various reports, right? So you can use this information to figure out how happy your customers are, how, how sad your customers are, right? Are, they, are there new customers onboarding to using your API? Uh, are the people churning out? They're letting go uh, of using your API and so on. So these help you build make decisions on the evolution of the API, right? Business value reporting is also another interesting area to be focusing on, right? Especially that gives you uh, a sense of like, like what, what the ROI of your API is, right? If it's, if it's an API product, is it earning the revenue that you want? If it's, if it's an API that you build for, uh, for example, uh, cost savings, right? For, for a sales service application like of a thing, Right? Is it really serving its purpose and saving you money? Right? So business value reporting is also uh, really important to understand the impact of your API. And then you can combine all of this information with, with the developer portal um, where you can observe what people are saying about your API. Are they asking for new features? Are they complaining about the user, uh, uh, about your API and so on? So all of this information combined together can be used for making roadmap decisions about the evolution of the API. And this is where API versioning and you know the, the, the rest of the life cycle becomes important. So this is where uh, this, the platform that you are running these APIs on needs to support things like being able to run multiple versions of your API, different kinds of versioning strategies that suit your business needs, the ability of migrating customers to the newer version, the ability of you know notifying customers when a new version is there. So all of these capabilities become important when evolving your API through its life cycle. And retirement, for example, is again another important aspect. So you need data to make decisions on retirement, right? You need data to figure out whether people are still using it, right, and so on. So at the end of the day, these uh, these five things that we talked about are, are really important aspects to be thinking about. As I mentioned in the beginning, we do have lots of frameworks for building APIs, but the real complications come when we are getting these APIs beyond our laptop into, into, into the enterprise now. So all of these aspects need to be carefully thought about uh, when developing and deploying APIs. So as we have been discussing throughout this session, discovery at the very beginning becomes 
a important aspect to figure out all the different types of APIs and systems that you may want to connect to. The quality of programmability of the APIs are important for productivity and safety and so on. API security, no need to mention it's important. So it's important to understand this landscape and so on. Monitoring helps us to fix issues faster and the life cycle helps us to evolve our APIs into the next phases. So having said all of that, I'd like to thank you for joining today's session. And I'd also like to mention <coughs> uh this uh which uh, if i don't do our marketing team will probably kill me <coughs> for not doing that we at wso2 are also we are working on this problem space trying to build a system which uh, allows api developers to focus building on their business logic so we've been working over the past 15 years uh, providing systems for customers to build or manage their apis uh, and we've seen the struggle that people face trying to combine lots of systems like uh, public API marketplaces, internal API discovery components, uh, API management solutions and API gateways, iPaaS systems, all of these together to try and build these platforms, right? So what we are trying to do uh, with Corio is to enable the system that allows developers to focus on building their business logic while we provide all of these capabilities as value added features in the platform. Uh, so I'd like to invite you to join in. It's uh, Corio is still in beta. So we just launched it a couple of months ago and we are in the phase of obtaining users feedback. I'd like to invite you to take a look at the website, go and register and uh, give us some feedback on, on what we're trying to build as well. Thank you so much uh, for joining in once again. And uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Nuan, for that phenomenal presentation. Um, and then to go off your point about Corio, if you check our chat panel, you'll see a bit.ly link to learn more about Corio. Um, so be sure to do that. There are also um, a link to these slides from his presentation today if you are interested. And like he said, let's jump into some Q&A. If you have questions, please submit them into the questions panel so we can get to them. Our first question here for you, Nuan, is what is the role of a developer developer portal and how does it fit into this story? Right, so uh, a developer portal is basically for consumers for APIs. It's, uh, it's kind of as a, uh, a a different purpose than, than the marketplace that we were talking about. The marketplace that we were talking about in this particular context um, was related to API developers for discovering different kinds of APIs that, they, uh, that are useful for building APIs. A developer portal, on the other hand, is for the consumers of the API where they come in uh, they discover APIs on the developer portal, go through the documentation, figure out how to get um, how to get um, credentials and so on. Okay, good to know. Um, we have another question here for you that reads, when you have different types of APIs in the system, for example, GraphQL, REST, how do you apply policies and rules in a generic way? Right. So, um, yeah. So when you have different uh, styles and types of APIs in a, in a system, it's um, uh, the, the policies have to differ. So if you think of REST APIs, for example, um, now how the way you secure REST APIs uh, is quite different than how you would secure uh, a GraphQL API, for example. Now thinking about rate limits, how you would rate limit the REST APIs by controlling the number of requests that come in within a given a different um, time period, uh, given time period. But if you think of rate limiting GraphQL APIs, you would go more into the looking at the queries of the uh, API, how complex they are, how much data are, are consumers trying to pull out from querying and so on. So, so similarly, you will apply the policies uh, in a different manner. So this applies to different kinds of APIs the same way, like if you're doing web sockets again it's different uh, grpc some aspects are different so for different types and styles of apis the way you should be thinking about policies is uh, slightly different there are commonalities too but there are differences as well 
Awesome. Good to know that you are able to apply the rules to those different kind of APIs. Um, all right, moving along. Um, an audience member is wondering, what is the better Java programming model to or for reach the better API programmability issue? Well, so, um, so, so in Java, I guess, so SDKs are the only uh, one I've, I've come across with um, in, in terms of Java. So uh, API providers usually offer Java SDKs, uh, but unfortunately the, the issue is these SDKs deal with um, usually the, the, the programming aspects, like you know uh, it exposes the functions properly and all of it. Um, so that's what I've seen so far as the, uh, as the most useful uh, component uh, type to interact with APIs using uh, using Java. Um, so unfortunately, I haven't seen like good quality SDKs that take care of like um, handling security. Of course, they do provide you know variables where you can store keys and all of that. But still, developers have to be um, aware of themselves of how to store these credentials securely, how to propagate them through the pipelines. Uh, securely and so on, right? So um, yeah, so there are good Java SDKs, uh, but but still developers have to be well aware of handling, uh, you know, stuff uh, like complicated situations uh, carefully. Right. Okay. Awesome. Good to know. We got some more audience questions here for you, and one of them reads: How can WSO2 be used to create a multi-experience development platform? Right. So, um, so when talking about so when, when talking about WSO2, we do offer different uh, types of products in the API space, and also Corio is also one of them. So we offer uh, a system where you can separate out the business logic of your API from the presentation uh, layer. So you, for example, you can have an API that is, say, we'll take the same example, like um, updating or, or processing orders in your system, right? Now you can offer an experience, you can offer different experience uh, interfaces for the same API. So like you can offer a, a, a much contracted JSON based um, API interface for mobile clients, for example, and you can offer a more, more rich um, JSON based interface for a web application. So for the same API, we give you the ability of having two different kinds of uh, experiences and it goes beyond you know uh, goes beyond protocol as well for example if you have like a web hook or something and you want to expose data or, over a web socket uh, that can be done as well so you can basically expose your data through a web socket and you know do protocol transformation and things like that so that's how we um, basically handle the multi experience use case yeah that's super powerful so definitely quite insightful there. Um, Alfred from the audience is wondering if you're able to speak to the value of open API and async API as evolving standards in the space. Yeah, so these, these standards are absolutely doing wonders for, for the API space, uh, especially open API since it, it is quite mature now and async API is picking up. So the beauty, that I see with these standards is that it's, it's enabling a lot of things uh, for automation. Like if you have today, uh, if you have a very rich open API specification, you can do all kinds of things of it in terms of automation. Now, if you look at uh, tools like Postman, for example, which specialize in um, you know the API testing space, right? They provide a facility where you can use this specification and auto generate very rich test cases for your API. So it's just a one click thing and you get a very rich set of test cases for your API. And the reason for that is basically uh, because of the specification and the standard. And also you can generate very rich client SDKs, which we ourselves are doing uh, at WSO2 through these systems. So that gives you the ability of uh, automatically creating a client SDKs uh, for your API. Right, so so I I see a huge value in these uh, specifications. I hope they were much more stringent. Now, now one of the problems in these specifications is that they these specifications are designed for human beings, 
so um, and and not for machines so what's happening in reality though is that you know people expect since humans are smart api providers expect humans would figure out somehow how to access this api you know uh, without a very good documentation so that's the unfortunate reality but the specifications by by its themselves are very strong uh, and very powerful they enable if done properly they enable unimaginable possibilities and same with async api we 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 are now seeing a huge adoption of async apis with the rise of event driven architectures uh, in the world of microservices so similar to open api this is now becoming popular and i'm pretty sure it's going to enable the same level of uh, possibilities um, as, as open api as well as, as the tools around it mature wow both of those seem super powerful uh, so it's exciting to see how it kind of transforms the space so let's see we've got a few more here um and another audience member is wondering how can they use choreo with java applications yeah so at the moment choreo is uh, limited to uh, what we call as uh, ballerina programs but uh, if you if i get into the details of it um, this is really not program language specific so how it works under the hood is um, we, we basically allow developers to develop apis in ballerina and using a low code experience as well and then we basically run a compiler and create docker images and put it into what we call as the data plane the runtime so our plan for bringing in onboarding java applications is also the same so people developers can develop uh, apis on java and as long as it's um, done in a container friendly way basically if you can basically package it into, into a uh, container you can bring it into choreo and give it uh, into its data plane to run and choreo will basically from there onwards take on the uh, runtime aspect of it um, since it's just another container uh, in kubernetes so uh, that's how we plan to uh, enable polyglot programs coming into Corio. We don't have support for non-ballerina apps yet, still, since we are still in the beta stage, but we will be enabling it soon. Okay, well, that is exciting, and we'll be sure to keep an eye out for that. And it looks like we've got one last question for you today, Nuon, and it's also Corio related. And this question reads, is Courier supposed to help me to develop, run, and manage my APIs all at once, or is it just about management only? No, so Courier actually helps you to both uh, develop and manage uh, your APIs. So it's, um, it's a platform for both. So it has some development aspects using low code and so on. Um, and uh, you know, as well as management aspects, which we have, we allow you to attach different kinds of policies, you know, um, right security, en enable, disable security, and you know, do the whole drill of uh, typical API management. Um, yeah, so so it's a platform for doing both as well. Okay, awesome. And I believe that is all the questions that we have for you today. Uh, so with that. Dizon would like to thank you, Nuon, for a phenomenal presentation. Dizon would also like to thank WSO2 for providing the audience with a great webinar. Lastly, thank you to everyone who attended today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day.